great to sing with you and worship with you and uh, to seek God with you. So excited that you are here to kick off uh, with us to help kick off our series in our study on Mark. I'm telling you right now, man, I want to encourage you, please bring your friends to this. Invite your friends to this series. It's going to be awesome. There's just so much to offer in this series. And what I would also tell you is that if you're not in a community group yet, please consider joining one, especially from this se- this series. It's going to last from now until Easter. And what we're going to do is we're going to take what we talk about in here and we're going to unpack it with one another in a group. And let me just tell you, you will get it today. There's just an awful lot of cool stuff to unpack in the Gospel of Mark. Now here's what I'm going to tell you. Mark uh, is better known as John Mark. He's a really interesting, uh, interesting man. Uh, John was his Hebrew name, and Mark was his Roman name. You see this dual citizenship going on in his life, like he's a Jew by birth, but he was born like in a Roman province, so he gets like this Roman birthright, and so he's going to leverage that, and God's going to leverage that for him to be able to write the Gospels. Now, when you read the Gospels and you think about Matthew, and then you got Mark, Luke, and John, what I would tell you is that Mark was not one of the guys that was one of the original 12. He was not one of the original 12, but he was kind of on the periphery, and as you'll see as history comes together, like he's got a front row seat, and he's got eyewitnesses account, and that's kind of what he, what he draws from, but we most get to hear about Mark in the book of Acts. When he goes out on this missionary journey, this missionary journey where he's going to go and he's going to take the kingdom of God, he's going to take the gospel news, he's going to move it out of Jerusalem, just like Jesus promised in uh, Acts chapter 1, he's going to move it out of the Jerusalem area, and he's going to be with a guy named Paul, and he's going to be with another guy named Barnabas. But something happens on this trip as he's traveling with, uh, with um, Barnabas and Paul. What do they say? They say like two's company, three's a crowd. Isn't that kind of what they say? Yeah, well, we see this kind of uh, happen in their missionary journey together. You see, as they're going around and they're spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ north of, uh, north of Jerusalem and uh, just kind of in the Asia area, what happens is Mark begins to long for Jerusalem. And he stops keeping that to himself, and he starts letting Paul know, like, man, I wonder what they're doing in Jerusalem right now. Sure would be nice to be in Jerusalem right now. And before you know it, Paul's just had it up to here. And he's like sick of Mark. Like, he can't wait for the missionary journey to end. Not just because he's tired, but he's like, I'm ready for the next one without this guy. So when they get back from their missionary journey, and Paul and Barnabas start planning the next one, Paul actually says this about Mark. Yeah, he's not coming back out with us. Paul's not much of a feeler. Here's the problem. Paul is saying that to, to, uh, to Mark's cousin. Mark was cousins with Barnabas. So Barnabas responds like any good, and these are my words, this is my spin on it, but Barnabas responds like any good family member would. He comes to the aid of his family. He says, dude, that's my cousin. To which I would assume Paul respond, your cousin, your problem, dude. And there's this separation, man. There's this, there's this angst. And, and then we just see kind of Mark fall off the pages of the missionary journeys. And we would think that God's done. But here's what I would tell you. Is that God is never done. When whether it's life or whether God chooses to close one door, he's always going to open another one. And both of these opportunities are going to bring God big time glory. Because you see, Mark thought, my, my days as a missionary are done. And God's looking at him and saying, yeah, but it's just getting started. In his wildest dreams, I don't know that Mark would have ever thought that God would commission him to write a gospel, an eyewitness account of Jesus Christ that would not just spread the gospel around the globe, but that it would transcend generations. You see the gospel of Mark written in 70 A.D., Man, it has been transcripted into hundreds, if not thousands, of other languages. Generations have heard the good news of Jesus Christ because what God commissioned through his life long ago. All to say, whenever you have a conversation, a Jesus conversation, with a family member or with a friend, and you think, oh, it's just a conversation, you have no idea how God can use that through generations. So don't give up. Keep stepping into those moments that God prepares for you because Mark just stepped out of one moment that God had provided, and he stepped into the next moment that God provided, and we get the gospel of Mark. 
Now, heading into today, you should have received an email from me asking you to read the first three chapters. There's no way that we can cover three chapters in 30 minutes. In fact, we're going to have a hard time just getting through 11 verses. That's how good it is. But this week, you should have read the first three chapters. Next week, I want you to come prepared, read Mark uh, chapter 4 through 6 is what we're going to have you guys read for next week. All right, that being said, let's dive into Mark. Mark chapter 1. Uh, if you wouldn't mind turning your Bibles there, turn your phones on, and uh, we can get there. And how does Mark start this thing out? Mark starts this thing out by saying, hey, this is the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Do you see how Mark describes it as this is the beginning of? You see, it's the beginning of. God has been talking about this moment for six, roughly 1,600 years. Written around 1,500, 1,300 B.C., somewhere in that area, you see, it is recorded in Genesis chapter 3, after the original sin, God has a conversation with Adam and Eve and the serpent, a.k.a. the enemy. And what he says is, after the original sin, he says, I'm going to put enmity between Eve, your offspring, and you, serpent, you, Satan. I'm going to put enmity there. And here's what's going to happen. Here's how this thing's going to play out. You're going to strike his heel but Eve, your offspring is going to crush the enemy's head. How do you crush a snake? How do you kill a snake? you got to crush the head. Who is God referring to? Jesus. 15, 1,600 years before this has ever happened. See, God's been talking about Jesus. He's been talking about his redemptive plan from the very beginning. And then if you fast forward a little bit further through this book of Genesis, you're going to see God, some history has taken place, and he looks down and he sees this dude that we know as Abraham. And he looks down and he's like, I can work with this guy. And he tells Abraham, he's like, dude, you're not perfect, but that's okay, I am, and I got this perfect plan. And so he says, here's what we're going to do, Abraham. I'm going to turn you into a great nation. Wow, I'm going to turn you into a great nation that will become known as the nation of Israel. And Abraham, through your descendants, we are going, I am going to bless all people. How can through one nation, how can one nation be a blessing to all people? What is God referring to? For 1,600 some, 1600 some years, God's been talking about Jesus. You know, if you read throughout the Old Testament, what you'll find is God talks about Jesus all the time. He even goes so far as to say, hey, he's going to be born of a virgin. He even goes in the prophet Isaiah, and we'll talk about him today, some 760 years before Jesus is born, God, through the prophet Isaiah, actually declares, Isaiah 53, the manner in which Christ will be crucified. Some 500 years, here God is talking again about his son, about his son Jesus. And, and but through the prophet Micah saying he will be born in Bethlehem. And guess what? Bam, bam, bam. One after another. It just happens. It just happens. It just happens. Like God speaks. And we can learn so much about him. God speaks and it happens. What I would tell you is if you're taking notes on your outline, we can see. Listen, God is good. We can see that God is faithful. We can see that God keeps his promises. He keeps his word. We can see that God can be trusted. That is a big takeaway from just a partial piece of, of verse one. We see that if God went to that much detail and that much length to prepare the way and to get things ready, listen, there is a skeptic here today wondering, is this a religious thing? Is there any truth to what is being said? History is on my side this morning, that God is faithful, that God can be trusted. He isn't just some religion. He is, the, he is not just the creator. He is our creator. And he has gone to great lengths to make himself known. And here Mark is, and this is what the beauty of Mark is, you guys. Listen, God has been talking about Jesus for 1,600 years. And Mark starts it off. The very first thing is he goes, he's here. This is it. This is it. He's here. Do you know what God's been talking about for all this time? Yeah, it's right now. 
It's happening right now. You guys, I get so excited about this. Poor souls last night. I was like on like 12 cups of coffee is what they thought, dude. That's how jacked up. But, but listen, this is absolutely exciting because it just shows you again, and, this, and I can't say this enough, it just shows you guys that God can be trusted. Listen, for, for, for you who have been following Jesus for a long time, I know that life isn't always easy. I know that. Because I've experienced that. And maybe this morning you just need to be reminded that God is faithful and that he's faithful to you. Maybe you need to be reminded that God can be trusted, that he, that he can be trusted with your heart and your hopes and your dreams and your circumstances. I'm just telling you what is going on, like where God's talking about and now he's here. God has made a way and it actually happened. And if God can fulfill all those promises, he can fulfill all the promises he made to us, which is he, his love is for us, his love is available to us. He goes to prepare a place for us that we can actually experience the kingdom of heaven now. It's awesome. All right, keep verse one up there, which we have, thank you. So when he says good news, the, we, we call it good news of Jesus Christ, we call it the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, the gospel of Jesus Christ is actually good news But as Mark pens this letter, there is something earth-shattering. The verb he uses here for good news is is this. It's called, um, let me make sure I get it. Uh, I can barely speak English, so you can imagine my Greek. Here we go. Uan Galizio. And I nailed it, dude. Nailed it. Uan Galizio, that is what he said. And we, from that verb, we get, uh, we get our word evangelism, which is to proclaim. But there's something very specific. You would only use this verb in proclaiming victory from a battlefield. So as Mark writes to the Christians in Rome, in their thinking, they're like, this is a declaration of victory from a battlefield. Uan Galizio is to proclaim victory. Mark is proclaiming victory. This is the beginning of salvation right here. But he's not done. You see, and if you look at your translation, not the one on the screen, we see Jesus Messiah. But in my translation, uh, what happens is our English words have a really hard time of capturing the essence of what the readers would have had. But we call him Jesus Christ. No. Like, Jesus Christ, is that, like, is that just like a bonus name that gets attached to him? Like, sometimes we treat it like it's his last name or something. But the reader would have understood something. It's not a surname. It's not an add to. It's not his last name. Christ, the name Christ, actually means anointed one. Anointed one is for kings only. It's for kings only. So Mark is declaring that Jesus is king, that he's ruler, that he has authority, and he has a kingdom. So we could put these two good news and Jesus Christ together and say this, Mark is basically declaring, this is the beginning of salvation that has come through King Jesus. God has been talking about this for 1,600 some years. What a declaration. What a day. You see, now, I told you that Mark didn't necessarily walk. Like, he was around Jesus, but he was not one of the 12. And so what what we're about to read here is some of his experiences. But more often than not, they're experiences that he had with Peter. Peter was actually one of the 12 who walked with Jesus. And after the missionary journey, what happened is uh, Mark went back to where? Jerusalem, because that's where he wanted to be. And that's where Peter was. And he got around Peter because they were already kind of, they, they knew of one another. And so what we're about to read right now, you guys, what we've already started to read. Listen, it, it is like uh, Mark recorded his conversations with Peter. This is like a podcast before there were even podcasts, man. Like we're getting this good stuff. And so, hey, look at, look at this with me now, uh, Luke chapter 1, let's just go uh, 2 through 11. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness and he preached the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
and the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to John the Baptist confessing their sins and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now John wore clothing made of camel's hair and you thought your sweater was itchy this morning. And he had a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. Mmm, tasty. And this was his message. I'm kidding about that. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. John says, I will baptize you with water, but he will baptize you. The Messiah will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love. You guys finish it up. You guys were a little bit stronger than this group over. No. Great job. With you, I am well pleased. All right, well, let's look at that. Let's go back to, let's go back to verse 2. It's Isaiah. Isaiah, who lived 760 years before John the Baptist, before Jesus, God says, Isaiah, I want you to prophesy. I want you to prophesy about a man who will be in camel's clothing, who is going to come out of the wilderness, who is going to prepare the way of the Messiah. I want you to say that. So John says that 760 years, and Mark is saying, whew, it's here. It's here. He's come. <coughs> this is incredible, you guys. This is awesome. So, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Told you I was going to get excited. <laughs> this is absolutely fascinating. And John comes, and, it, and, uh, and, he's and he's baptizing. But listen to this. Listen to the detail. Listen to the detail that God goes to. You see, John was born to a woman named Elizabeth. And his father was named Zechariah. Elizabeth, has a, the name has a meaning. And the meaning is God's oath. That's what her name means. The oath of God. His father's name, Zechariah, has a meaning as well. It means God remembers his oath. You see, even the union of this couple 760 years later that are going to produce offspring known as John the Baptist is declaring God has remembered his promises. John the Baptist in the Jordan River telling people the kingdom of God is near, that it's coming, is a living declaration that God remembers his promises. And what I want to tell you this morning is God remembers his promises. For the skeptic that you're wondering, can I trust, can I believe, Yes, you can. For the believer who needs to be encouraged, God remembers his promises. And maybe what you're going through doesn't feel good. Life doesn't always feel good, but God is good. And I want you to remember that God works all things, even the painful things, even the ugly things, even the difficult things for the good of those who love him for his glory. And here John the Baptist is, 760 years after God prophesied every detail of his life, speaking to the very essence that God remembers the promises that he made. And he's baptizing in the Jordan. Now the Jordan is a very historical place with significant meaning. You see, if you go back into the Old Testament again, God had made a promise to his people after he turned, he made a promise to Abraham to turn him into a nation. They became slaves in Egypt. And then that God delivered them out of that, and God said, I will give you a land. It's known as the promised land. But they were going to have to cross the Jordan River. Well, after 40 days of being in the wilderness, or it's not 40 days, 40 years of being in the wilderness, God is about to deliver on his promise. However, they have to cross the Jordan. And they have to cross the Jordan in the springtime. Here is the best picture I could find you, and it does not do it justice. Check it out. Now imagine that there is a lake on the other side of that, and you and I are fly fishing together, and I'm like, dude, that is the best lake we will ever be in if we get there. But I'll tell you what, you go first. 
Not a lot of people are going to take me up on that because, I mean, that's the, type of, that's the type of water that somebody dies in. Well, I promise you that when, they had, when the Israelites had to cross from the wilderness into the promised land, it was even crazier than that. And what the priests had to do is they had to pick up the Ark of the Covenant and they had to take a step of faith into the Jordan River to receive God's promises because God's about to deliver the promise. So they put their feet in the water. And what happens? God causes the water to stop flowing. And he holds the water in front of them and it drains down behind them and they walk through on dry ground. Why is it significant that John is baptizing in the Jordan River? Because God is about to deliver on another one of his promises. Jesus, the Messiah, salvation has come and he's here. You see, this is a big, big deal that this is happening right here. This is what it looks like today. We can just show them a quick picture of what it, there we go. That's what it looks like today. And so you can picture John the Baptist just publicly declaring, repent from your sins, for the kingdom of God is near. And we read that they came from Jerusalem, as far as Jerusalem and Judea. Well, how far of a hike is that? Let's check it out. We've got a map. There it is. See that circle right there? The Israelites, when they came into the promised land, would have moved from right to left, and they would have come into the land around that circle area, around Jericho. There's Jericho, because you remember they had to walk around it seven days. So they're in that area, and that's where John is baptizing, because that's where the wilderness is. But we also read that in that moment, is that, um, is that so there John is, and uh, he is declaring that the kingdom of God is near. That's an absolutely fascinating statement, that the kingdom of God is near. Over the past few months, we've talked an awful lot about the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Let me just give you the best description that I can give you today. The kingdom of God is any place the will of God takes place. Put a different way, the kingdom of God exists where the will of God is done. The kingdom of God exists where the will of God is done. This is a beautiful thing because the kingdom of God stretches everywhere where the will of God is done. Listen, that can happen inside a person's heart. That can happen inside of our thoughts. Like if our thoughts are leading us towards truth, and that is the kingdom of God taking place in our thoughts. Anytime you reach out to help somebody less fortunate, anytime you reach out to love somebody in Jesus' name, anytime you try to care somebody, the kingdom of God has come in that moment. It exists where his will is being done. And John is saying the kingdom of God is near. And so into this moment steps Jesus Christ. If we can go back to that map for just a second. We read that Jesus came from Nazareth. Look at that hike. We live in Wyoming. We love hikes. So Jesus had to make the hike up from the Sea of Galilee in the Galilee region down to this area. And he comes by himself. He doesn't have his disciples yet. And he is going to be baptized. It's a fascinating deal. We, we see that he comes and we see that John recognizes him. If you look in the Gospel of Matthew, you can actually read the account of what takes place. Jesus comes to be baptized and when John sees him, we are looking at history because John knows who he is. This is absolutely fascinating what we read in Mark. It is the end of one era and it is the beginning of a new era. We are looking at a historical event take place at the Jordan River where God will deliver on his promises for all people, which again, God can be trusted. He is trustworthy. You see, we are moving from the old to the new. What we are seeing like as Jesus comes from Nazareth down to the Jordan River and he steps in the water and he asks Jesus, or he asks John to baptize him. You guys, we are seeing the fulfillment of a man's work that is completed. John's work was to come and make, make plain the way, make straight the way. His job is finished. 
And Mark is recording, John was there and he sees Jesus and Jesus comes to be baptized. It's the end of era. It's the end of, a, a, it's the end of one man's work. And it's the beginning of a new era. And it's the beginning of a new one's work. The Messiah's work, a promise of God's love for all people. This is absolutely historical and exciting what is taking place in the Jordan River. And so they have this debate like, hey, you should baptize me. And Jesus is like, no, you should baptize me. John relents baptizes him. And here's what we're seeing happen. Why would Jesus have to be baptized? This is the inauguration of his ministry. This is the very start of of his ministry. That's why he's got, this is why he's down at the Jordan. This is the beginning of his ministry. It's the beginning. This is salvation come in King Jesus. This is the origin. This is the beginning start. God's been talking about it. Now it's here. The kingdom of God is now. Like John was saying, hey, there's one who's coming. I'm baptizing with water. This isn't going to save your soul, but there's one who's going to come and baptize you with the spirit of God. Wow. You see, we're not Jewish, so we don't get it like they did. But when Mark writes this Every God-fearing Jew knew where the Spirit of God dwelled. Where did he dwell? Down the road in the temple. And John is telling them something revolutionary that Jesus, the Messiah, is going to come and he's going to baptize them with the Spirit. Why are people lining up to hear this message? I'll tell you why. Because long ago there lived a prophet named Elijah. Elijah wore clothes made out of camel hair. And he came with the similar message, repent. And John is saying, repent. And every God-fearing Jew knew that God had promised a Messiah. And they, they were excited. They wanted to be about his kingdom. They just had the wrong picture in their mind. You know, like when you're on eHarmony and you see this picture and you're like, yes, I would like to get to know him. I would like to get to know her. You see this picture and it looks so good. And then you see them and you're like... What happened? This is two different people. That's what happened with the Jews and Jesus. They thought he was going to come like David, like this good-looking guy who's going to come wielding a sword and he's going to roll up with like his 30 warriors and it's time to kick some Roman tail and take over the kingdom, peace and prosperity. They thought Jesus was going to come set them free from the Romans. Jesus did come to set us free, but he came to set us free from fear, from sin, from guilt, from shame, from ourselves. And he didn't look like anything like the picture that they had in their mind. He was way better. And so Jesus, you get this inauguration of his ministry, but Jesus is also... In the, in the Jordan River because he's identifying with us. He is going to be a sin offering. The people had been there repenting of their sins, asking forgiveness so they could be a part of the kingdom. Well, Jesus is the kingdom, and he's there, and he's identifying with us, and he's identifying with all God's promises saying, I can and I will take away the sins of the world. Those are the reasons he's there, but when Jesus comes up out of the water, what does he see? He sees heaven being torn open. This is really interesting. Mark uses the word schizo, which is the Greek verb for torn. This idea of heaven being torn open is, is amazing because, again, through the Jewish reader's eyes, they're familiar with the kingdom of heaven being open. Like if you go back to the book of Ezekiel, you'll read that God opened the heavens and Ezekiel could see in. But listen, this morning when you were eating, when you went to get that coffee, especially on this day where we lose an hour of sleep, you opened the bag of those coffee, coffee grinds went, goodness. And then you closed it back up. Maybe you went and you grabbed some of those Eggos, you know, those waffles, or maybe, maybe Cheerios is your brand of cereal of choice, and you opened it, and then you closed it. But Mark didn't use the word God. Jesus saw heavens open. Jesus saw heaven torn open, schizo. This scholar, this wise man named Jewel, this is what he says about this moment. It would be easy to assume that when Jesus saw heaven open, he was making a way through Jesus to us. Like we could, Jesus to us, we can now make our way to God. But Joel contends, Jesus saw 
when Mark writes that Jesus saw heaven torn open, God was saying, ready or not, here I come. Because you see, what is torn open cannot easily be closed back together in its original form. And Jesus saw heaven, God, tearing it open, saying, I am here for you. I am coming to you, and I'm tearing heaven wide open to declare that this is my son in whom I am well pleased, and the kingdom of God is now, and it's for you. What a bold, glorious declaration that takes place in Mark chapter 1. See, we can reject God. We can say that he doesn't exist, but there's one who tore the heavens open to come after you and me. Isn't that good news? Salvation has come in King Jesus. It's awesome. And so then we see the Spirit of God descend on on Jesus. It didn't look like a dove. It just descended like a dove. Okay, it didn't look like a dove. It just descended like one. If you've ever seen a dove land, that's, that's how it's going. But here's where I want to direct your attention. Again, recorded in human history, you have the Trinity in real time with real people. In this moment, we see God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit together coming for humanity. We see it in Genesis 1, and now we see it in Mark chapter 1. This is amazing what is taking place right here. The Trinity is in that moment. God has been silent for 400 years. John the Baptist declaring that the kingdom of God is near was God beginning to speak again. And in this moment, after 400 years, God declared, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Why is he pleased? Because Jesus had come to fulfill the promises of God. God can be trusted. So what are we supposed to do with this? There are, I, would, I would say there are three things that I would like you to take from this. The first one is this, trust in God. There's more than enough evidence that he is real, that he is love, and his love exists for you. Mark chapter one screams of that. So for the skeptic, what I would say is, put your trust in Jesus, that takes faith. Even if you don't know everything, read about him throughout Mark with us and follow his example. That takes surrender. But in doing, in believing, in following, in faith, in surrender, you will find life. You will experience the kingdom of God. The second thing I would like us to consider today is God's kingdom. It exists everywhere the will of God is done. And Jesus invites us into that. He invites us this morning into his kingdom. His invitation that was for them then is for us today. He invites you to be a part of his kingdom. But in order to be a part of his kingdom, you have to lay your kingdom down. Your wants. Your desires. And you have to become a citizen of his you have to want his kingdom, and he, his kingdom is greater than our kingdom. His kingdom is good. It is love. It is eternal. And this morning, he invites you to join and be a part of the reality of his kingdom that is right now. You don't have to wait. You don't have to wait until you die to experience his kingdom. You can experience it now. And if you have not experienced his kingdom today, what I would implore you, what I would ask you, is step into his kingdom today by surrendering your life to him and becoming a citizen of his, his kingdom. The third thing I would ask us to do from this passage is if you have not been baptized and you love Jesus, you're a follower of Jesus, if you have not been baptized, I would ask you to get baptized in Jesus' name. Something all of his followers do. If you read throughout the New Testament, they believe, they surrendered, they followed. And not necessarily always in that order. But after that, they would always get baptized. Trust. Repent. Join his kingdom. Experience his goodness. Get baptized in Jesus' name. This week, please read Mark 4 through 6. And next week, I believe Tammy's going to be sharing. And the week after that, Chris is going to be sharing. I'm going to be in the Holy Land. So you have to be here, but I'll be sending videos back from the places that we're talking about. It's going to be awesome. You won't want to miss one week of this series. Let me pray for us. Lord God, thank you so much for my friends who are here today. 
Lord, I want to say thank you that we have history to look at to see just how real you are, how good you are, how trustworthy and how faithful you are. Lord, I want to say thanks for making a place for us in your kingdom that we might live with you, be with you the way that you always intended. Lord, I pray for those of us who have found you that we would share and spread and declare the glory of Jesus wherever we go. And now, Holy Spirit, speak to us in the ways that we need most, those far from you, those close to you. Encourage those who need to be encouraged. Draw those who need to be drawn. In the power of Jesus' name, let it be so. Amen.